Welcome uh, to Thinking Aloud and to this video for our BYU Humanities website. Um, I want to thank, as always, Marcus Smith uh, for letting us uh, use his space. This is really lovely here. And we're visiting them with two scholars uh, instead of one, like our usual. We have Kimberly Johnson here and Oren Eisenberg. Kimberly Johnson uh, is known to many who listen to this program. She's professor of English at BYU, where she's a poet translator and scholar of English Renaissance literature, especially of lyric poetry. Uh, she's received several fellowships for her work, uh, which include awards from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Emblem for the Arts, uh, and the Mellon Foundation. And this week, she's organized a symposium at BYU on the devotional lyric uh, entitled Illuminating the Word. And one of the guests she's invited is Oren Eisenberg, who's Associate Professor of English at the University of California at Irvine. Um, Eisenberg's the author of the book Being Numerous, subtitled Poetry in the Ground of Social Life, uh, published in 2011, and is a recipient of fellowships from the Frankie Institute for the Humanities at the University of Chicago, and also the National Endowment for the Humanities. It makes sense, Kim, to start with you um, by asking you what the inspiration was for this symposium on the devotional lyric. Well, I, it's funny. I had been at a conference on John Donne last winter, and I got to talking with one of the other participants in that, con in that conference, a, a religious studies and theology person named Constance Fury. We were talking about um, the relationships between, uh, between lyric poetry, the history of lyric poetry, and the history of religious ritual. And we had this sort of invigorating conversation, sort of revol revolving around this anthology that I'd recently published um, uh, or co-edited. And Constance said, wouldn't it be great to be able to have this conversation? And I said, <laughs> hold that thought. I yeah. can make this happen. So um, it was sort of born out of this tiny little conversation that, that Constance Fury and I had. Um, and it makes sense to me because over the course of the, uh, the history of lyric poetry, there's been a close association between... Um, between the writing of these sort of short poems and the uh, and the participation in religious ritual, um, though there have been negotiations and renegotiations over the course of the last three millennia, as you might expect. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, there there are uh, maybe natural affinities between the two practices, and we wanted to just create a conversation, an ongoing couple of days worth of conversation that would bring in perspectives from people who work on, uh, work on devotional poetry as a scholarly pursuit, mm -hmm. people who theorize lyric as a scholarly pursuit, people who approach it from a theological or religious studies background, and people who are currently writing poetry. Uh, I thought that that would be a lively exchange. It's and a very it, eclectic group. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a nicely designed symposium, I think, in that respect. Uh, in fact, Constance Fury mentioned to me yesterday how engaging she finds the group, the mixture of people. Um, right. You mentioned the three millennia of devotional lyric poet. It's pretty impressive. And in fact, the anthology that you co-edited with Jay Poplar, uh, Before the Door of God, um, breaks this down into several historical periods. One of them, you talk about the flourishing of the devotional lyric, which is the late 16th, early 17th century. Sure. Why do you think that era was an era in which the devotional lyric flourished? And what are some examples of people who wrote during that era that you like especially? Sure. Well, um, I think that one of the reasons, well, there are a complex of reasons uh, that you see this flourishing. One is simply the increase of literacy, that pe more people are writing poetry. But lyric starts to gain traction in a sort of unprecedented way during the course of the Renaissance. And it may have to do, it probably does have to do with a combination of um, new ideas of what constitutes selfhood as occasioned by the inquiries of, you know, this new humanism that was coming into being, um, new inquiries about the value of persons as were precipitated by the Reformation and by its sort of transfer of focus in matters of faith from uh, the sort of uh, organized cosmology to a more individually centered cosmology, mm -hmm. which brought with it all sorts of sort of um, uh, new, more urgent pressures on the conceptualization of self, selfhood, what it means to be a person, what it means to be a soul, and how that soul relates to God. These are all um, issues that get amplified and mm -hmm. stirred up and fueled. Those are three different metaphors that I've just used there. Um, but <laughs> all of them get sort of excited right. by, the, by the Reformation and by uh, this sort of rise of humanism. So there are a lot of ingredients that go into the stew and make it a sort of ripe 
pot sure. to, to make lyrics come out of. Do you have any favorite devotional poets from that era? I have all the favorite devotional poets I know that there are many that you're in the anthology, um, for example, but, you know, But certainly, I mean, John Dunn is, is yeah, exemplary okay. in many, many ways because he wears on his sleeve the sort of fraughtness of the process of all these negotiations and reinterpretations and um, and anxieties. Dun- John Dunn is sort of the poster boy for religious anxiety, and, and rightly so. Um, and so I, I like to spend time with Dunn. I like the fact that Dunn disorganizes the way that we expect faith to go. George Herbert always seems to be more staid, more predictable, mm-hmm. um, but in fact is just as freaked out as John Dunn is. <laughs> and there's something pleasurable in seeing somebody uh, who who is on his face, um, pious and un... un, uh, un I can't come up with a better word than unanxious in his uh, in his participation in faith. Nevertheless, registering the tremors of uncertainty that undergird all negotiations with the unknown. Yeah, great. Now, uh, our other guest here, Orrin Eisenberg, uh, has not written extensively about Dunn or Herbert, but he was a guest that you invited. Yes. What was the Why impetus for inviting Orrin Eisenberg? Orrin Eisenberg? Yeah. Uh, Orrin Eisenberg has written this wonderful book called Being Numerous, in which he encourages us to think about lyric poetry differently than many critics have tended to think of lyric poetry. And I'm going to leave the sort of good back of the jacket summary to him, but his sense is that there is a moral and ethical component to lyric poetry that has to do with the constitution of persons and how we understand the value of personhood and right. how that is a deeply moral act. And so even though he's not somebody who has like plighted his troth, so to speak, to the devotional lyric tradition, the arguments that he has to make about lyric certainly do reflect the kinds of ethical um, overlaps that exist between poetic practice and religious practice. All right, good. So let me ask you, you know, about this book, uh, Oren. Uh, I, I agree with Kim. It's a, it's a, it's a really interesting, smart book. It's a, it's a really interesting read of the poets that you address you. in the book. And some of these poets, people like William Butler Yeats, George Oppen, Frank O'Hara, did any of these lyric poets write specifically lyric poems? Mm-hmm. Devotional lyric poems. Oh, devotional lyric Sorry, poems. Sorry, devotional yeah. lyric poems. Sorry. <laughs> um, because we used to ask about the lyric more broadly, but I'm curious about the devotional lyric for a moment. Well, Yeats uh, has an enormously complex relation to religious poetry. Yeah. Um, uh, he inherits not the devotional tradition in the sense of its dailiness, the negotiation of a kind of an ongoing life in relation to uh, spiritual pursuits or uh, uh, the spiritual sense of self, um, he inherits a kind of apocalyptic tradition uh, from Blake uh, and that form of religious romanticism. Um, mm-hmm. So he was a deeply religious poet, but his religion was immensely idiosyncratic. Um, so, uh, you know, he was interested in theosophy and in astrology and in right. just about any kind of uh, tradition that was non-mainstream. Um, precisely on the ground of its non-mainstreamness. That is to say, the, the more uh, orthodox a tradition was, the more suspect it was. Um, and so we had this interesting combination of uh, a, a religious temperament and an experimental skeptical temperament. Um, so he would join these organizations uh, like the, Gold, the Order of the Golden Dawn, mm. um, which were filled with esoteric rituals um, uh, and the kind of Neoplatonist versions of uh, religion. Um, and then he would get kicked out of them uh, because he would want to test the rituals scientifically. Um, uh, so he uh, would go through these initiation procedures and then he would be evicted. Um, from the... <laughs> <laughs> but his poetry... Um, is illegible without a sense of struggle with transcendence. Uh, So he, more than uh, the others about whom I've written, uh, was a poet who uh, is not just kind of negotiating with uh, a a world, uh, as poets after 1945 are often said to have done, drained of transcendence or in which the the loss of the transcendent is a kind of crisis, Mm -hmm. um, but one for whom the possibility of a reachieved relation to transcendence was always driving his poetic work. Yeah, okay. Do you see the devotional lyric as a subset of the lyric, Mm -hmm. or is it a different kind of poem because it's devotional? 
Well, you know, what I said a moment ago about the, these kind of two traditions of religious lyric, the devotional and the apocalyptic, um, uh, is maybe a way into this question. Um, because uh, there's a way in which all poetry is devotional in the sense that it represents kind of ongoing negotiation with the work of being alive in the world. Totally. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Amen. um, And an intense consciousness of the rules by means of which are any way of making sense um, is conducted or constructed, right? So because poets have to make their own little worlds, um, have to make uh, the worlds of their own writing, um, they find themselves in the position of people who are obligated to the making and maintenance of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, they find themselves in a kind of miniature uh, a version of the, of the position of God. Um, <laughs> uh, and they also wonder what has licensed them um, to act as gods in this way. Right. Uh, so uh, there's a kind of ritual performance. Every time you revisit the scene of the blank page, um, there's a ritual performance any time you take up the words of another person, another poet, take them into your own mouth and ask yourself, are these my words? In what sense, as I repeat um, this language, whether it's actual liturgical devotional language or poetic language, um, in what sense is this language mine? What does it mean for me to say it now, today? Um, so in that sense, there is a way in which all poetry belongs to the devotional tradition. Um, all uh, lyric poetry belongs to the devotional mm-hmm. tradition. Um, there's, uh, you know, again, that additional uh, tradition of, of uh, prophetic or apocalyptic poetry that uh, is a slightly separate conversation. But. Yeah, sure. Good. That's an interesting answer, though, about, about the devotional nature of all poetry. I mean, that's, that's, I find that really insightful. Perhaps on that basis, I can initiate a discussion between the two of you. You've each written books uh, that make strong claims about poetry, but they're rather different claims. So... Kim, uh, you published a book this year uh, entitled Made Flesh, uh, Sacrament and Poetics in Post-Reformation England. And in it, you bring special attention to the way poems work as literary artifacts, right? So the the specificity of poems' structure, their language, etc. But you, Orrin, in your book, draw a distinction uh, between poems as artifacts and poems as ideas or intentions. And in fact, you draw a distinction between poetry and poems. Let me ask you first if you would sort of expound a bit on what that distinction is about. Sure. Um, The distinction is a distinction of long-standing. Shelley, for example, uh, in uh, his defense of poetry, makes the distinction between poetry in what he calls the general sense. Um, And poetry in the general sense includes all forms of cultural construction. Um, So on his account, the makers of laws and the makers of cities and countries, uh, the makers of new intellectual systems and sciences uh, are all poets because they all partake of uh, a generative impulse, a capacity for making uh, that belongs to the human being as such. Uh, In contrast to that, there are uh, poems in the particular sense, uh, which are the verbal objects that we call poems. Um, uh, and he's interested in the relation between the two of them, but also in the non-identity between the two of them. Hmm. Um, so uh, as I sort of dwelled and took up this distinction, um, it seems to me that there are poets who uh, are interested in poems and in the making of poems and the making of these artifacts that uh, create charged relations between individuals and language on the page. Um, and poets who are interested in poetry, that is the generative capacity that gives rise um, to the capacity to make or uh, to belong to the world. Okay. Kim, you're a scholar and a poet also. Does that distinction hold true for you, and does it hold true for the devotional lyric in in particular? Uh, I'm going to flip that question just a moment, because while he's been talking, it's occurred to me, I've been joking over the course of the last couple days that Orton and I disagree about a number of things, but I actually think that we're coming at the same problem from two sides of Mm -hmm. a coin. Um, He is far more interested in poetry, poetry in the general sense, and I, as both a scholar and as a practitioner... Um, sort of don't care about poetry in the, in the, in the general sense. Oh, but you do. <laughs> <laughs> but I really, really am interested in the poem, the poem, the poem yeah. as an object, the poem as an artifact, and in uh, trying to discover the ways in which that object works, not n- not only upon the reader, but also independently of the reader, if you can sort of conceive of 
of uh, poem's independence from the reader. So I, I'm interested in this sort of material artifact that is the remnant uh, or the uh, the leftover of the poetic process, the the um, this sort of bringing poems into being, the making that Oren describes and accounts for so beautifully in his book. Okay, so I'm wondering, on that basis, if you could flip around the idea of what's general and what's particular. I mean, poetry is a general category, poems are specific. But, you know, in your book, Made Flesh, Kim, you talk about this poem by George Herbert, the poem Love Unknown, Mm -hmm. which on its surface communicates kind of a theme of grace over works. But you point out that the actual poem is so invested in labor, uh, in the the labored nature of the the, the lines. Uh, They emphasize labor that it seems actually to suggest a Catholic theology of works over that of grace. In that respect, do you think that poems are more complex and more general than the idea of poetry? I think that poems invite us to treat them as if they are more complex and more general than the large idea. Um, I think that that's, maybe that's the quality, uh, uh, again, to go to gesture back toward Oren's argument, um, the quality that he describes where a poem communicates more than its words do. I mean, that's certainly true. There's something that happens that's beyond the mere mechanics of sentence and grammar and structure and things like that. So what is that thing, the thing that we experience when we participate in poetry as readers, as writers, as thinkers and scholars? What is that thing? That's something that uh, seems to defy particularization. And yet I'm really interested in, interested in popping the hood to see if I can talk about how it happens. <laughs> Good. Or how would you respond to Kim's assessment of that? Well, I'll question. go with more complex um, because poetry in the general sense, that is to say the idea of poetry or the capacity to make poems, um, aims at, or the poets who are interested in it, aim at a kind of burning simplicity. They want a purification mm-hmm. of uh, all of the complexities uh, that give rise to division within the world, uh, right? So the work of making a particular thing or of receiving a particular thing is charged with distinction making. It's charged with working out um, of the boundaries of sense. Uh, and the poets who are invested uh, in uh, poetry in the general sense are invested in the idea um, that there could be something like a meaning or a value or a sense without boundaries um, that would exclude no one that would not draw a picture of what it is to be a person that could conceivably leave anyone out um, who is in need of moral regard. Um, So in that sense, um, generality or indeed universality uh, is what poetry aims at, whereas Mm -hmm. poems aim always at uh, particularity, they aim at solidarity, they aim Mm, at exchange, they aim at conversation, um, but they cannot achieve, even if they desire, universality or generality in the largest imaginable way. Okay. I'm with him. All right, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm perfect agreement. I'm so glad. We're, we're done. Yeah, no. I, a few more minutes, actually. Uh, this, this, this idea about universality, which is an idea that, to which you appeal in your book, and it's a really compelling category. One question I would have is just, is universality always the same? I mean, is it the same over time? Uh, I'm thinking here about the, the, the question of literary history when you have poems that strive towards something like an absolute. And, and specifically, how do you tell the story in literary history about the devotional lyric? You know, one could just create a chronology. This got written then, and this got written then. But does, does the devotional lyric form demand a different kind of literary historical telling? Mm-hmm. Kim, what do you think? And then uh, I'll give both yeah. of you a chance to answer this question. I think the devotional lyric form at least requires an awareness of the varying contexts that produce the poems because the poems respond necessarily to the pressures of culture and religion and and the sort of the way that culture and religion make politics happen in different ways. And the poems are sensitive antennas to those kinds of uh, those kinds of vibrations. And so a poem, a devotional lyric that's written in 1550 is going to resonate to a different frequency than a devotional lyric written in 1944. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that um, some, that, that this is perhaps not true 
necessarily of all lyrics, though I'm not sure that I'm necessarily going to commit to that position. But because the devotional lyrics sort of intends a negotiation of the kinds of uh, theological questions that are in the air, um, it, it invites a historical awareness. Maybe I'll put it that way. It doesn't demand, but invites a his- that it, it invites a richer yield from a historical awareness. Okay, is it a different kind of historical? Oh, yeah, I think it's an interesting way to put it. Is it a different kind of historical awareness uh, than you would trace if you were doing a history of the novel or or a history of the elegy? Or the descriptive poem. Yeah, probably. See, I, that's why I was qualifying it. I'm not sure that that's true. I don't okay. think that... At the same time, I want to say literature is transhistorical or ahistorical. And it is, you know, it is, a, it, it is there to be, I don't know, sucked in deeply across boundaries of time and space. And yet, nevertheless, you know, if you know something about early 20th century s- southern United States, you'll get more out of Faulkner than you would if you didn't, right? Yeah. So, I don't know. That's Warren, a cop out. <laughs> no, it's not. Warren, how would you, how would you take that well, question? Our, our accounts of the precincts of the sacred do vary across time. Mm-hmm. Um, how far they extend, what their boundaries are, what actually lies inside mm-hmm. of them, and so on. Um, and so, yes, obviously, um, uh, any account of universality uh, is going to be a historical account. Um, uh, in the vector of of travel uh, for those accounts in the uh, say move from uh, the nineteenth into the twentieth century has always been toward um, a greater uh, abstraction and a greater minimalism mm-hmm. um, so for example, uh, you know if the question was originally right, how do we create an account of the person so abstract, so minimal, so non demanding um, that we don 't leave Jews out um, mm-hmm. right in you know uh, the 1940s. Um, now uh, we're worried about an account of the person so minimal, so subtractive of particularity uh, that we want to make sure not to leave animals out, um, that we want to make sure not to leave rocks and trees out, um, right. right? So that there's a kind of <laughs> ecolo- expanding ecological consciousness that wants to treat elements of the world um, with the privilege of personhood. That is to say, um, with the moral regard that we bring to those things that deserve moral regard. Um, right, so there is a kind of historical vector toward minimalism with respect to our account of persons um, and our account of universality. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't get to the generic question um, that you were asking a moment ago about how it is that a history of devotional lyric could be different than the history of, say, elegy. Or, um, uh, but I think the, the problem is shaped the same way um, because right, if you're interested in the history of elegy, uh, you're interested, on the one hand, in what it means to have undergone a loss. Um, uh, well, and, and, and history itself is a kind of a loss in that respect. Sure. Right. Um, history is uh, a, a long litany of losses. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the very idea Thanks of history. Thanks for the word litany there. I appreciate <laughs> <that>. <laughs> okay, good. Um, We have a few minutes left. Some scholars argue that poetry exists not only to be appreciated, but to achieve real effects in the world, right? The, Poetry should move us, it should persuade us, it should mobilize public sentiment. Um, now, Kim, you're a poet, and you also write devotional poetry. Do you see your devotional poems in that way? Are they written to move? Are they written to be appreciated? And are they different as devotional poems than if they were poems of a different type? Well, I don't write all devotional poems. I've got a few devotional poems. But I, I think that, I mean, it will not surprise you at all to hear that I sort of stop being aware of what might happen to them once they leave me. I'm interested in them as a poet, as, as a scholar, as artifacts. I'm really interested in how to make something um, that functions with gears and what's the word that what's the phrase that Williams uses a machine made of words I mean I'm not I, I, I try not to be mechanistic but I, I do feel to some degree that there are components that can be manipulated and that you get down and greasy and dirty with them and you figure out how the whole thing operates and so that that's that is all just to say that I don't it's overwhelming to me to even imagine what might happen to them after they leave me. That's beyond my purview. That's beyond okay. what I can imagine or control or conceive. Um, and so I just sort of content myself with 
the thing at hand, the object at hand, which I try to honor and reverence as a thing worth attending to, um, regardless of what happens to it after it leaves my my soul possession. Okay. Does that resonate, Orm, with the, with the work of the poets you address in your book? You know, you have Frank O'Hara's, the George Oppen's. The, does that resonate, or, or do they have a different view of their poetry than what Kim just articulated? These poets are, are marked by, and I, maybe this is true of many poets. Um, I, I don't know if it's true of Kim. She can attest to that for herself. Um, these poets are marked by a kind of interesting and profound uh, disrelation between the work of making, which is completely absorbing, to which they devoted formidable and powerful energies, um, and their desires for poetry. Mm-hmm. Um, that is to say, what they imagined or wished would happen in some way as a result of having made this thing. Um, how it is, what the path is from the work of the making um, and the destiny uh, of the made thing. Um, was not something that they could imagine uh, or could theorize fully. Um, and there's just a huge mystery in there, right? How it is that poems come to make change in the world. They do, they have, they will again. Um, but how it is that happens, those are acts of chance, they're acts of grace, they're right. acts of, they're right. kinds of miracles. Yeah. Um, when a poem gets taken up and makes something happen, it cannot be as a result of the intention um, or the casting forth um, from the hand of the maker. It's, it's a kind of grace. All right, and can I say that what he's yeah. just described, I mean, it, it would feel presumptuous on my part. It would feel like a, a little bit of hubris to imagine that there's something that I could make that's going to go out and change the world. But the one way in which I can sort of understand and maybe apply the kinds of ideas or the, the sort of ideals that Oren's articulating here is when I'm in the classroom with my students, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I can't guarantee that any world change is going to happen because of words I put on the page, but I can guarantee, virtually guarantee, and it doesn't feel hubristic to do so, that there's going to be world change that happens when I teach a classroom full of students how to engage yeah. ethically and aesthetically and um, responsibly with not just one text, but all the texts. Okay, so world change on a classroom level, the macrocosm, That's the microcosm. Right. We're back to John Donne. That's right. And, and on that note, uh, thank you both for talking this morning. It's been a great symposium you put together, Kim. And thank you. Orrin, thank you for, for coming to BYU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt.